And then yesterday morning, the Lord completely changed. And I'm going to preach something that I've never heard preached before. I didn't borrow it. I read a scripture and I've never preached it before, but I'm going to preach it this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Once again, it's so good to have all of you here. It's so good to have our saint with us, Sister Jane. We just love her to pieces. Amen. Amen. And Saul was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committing them to prison. Verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And I want to preach to you on the subject of this this morning. What do you do when you get scattered? What do you do when you get scattered? Could we just pray one more time? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us today, dear God, to do a good job and speak something into our hearts that will give us a foundation of what to do in troubling times that may lie ahead for us. We love you, Jesus. Anoint us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. I believe this morning that every one of us that are here today, I'm going, to, I'm going to work from the premise, and I like to do this, and I say that a lot of times. I'm going to work from the premise that everybody here wants to have a victorious life for God. I'm going to work from the premise that none of us are just here for the fishes and loaves. I don't want to be here, and I don't think that, and I don't believe this, I don't believe any of us are here, or just to get what we can get from God. But I want to operate this morning, if I can use that term, or, or I want to preach this morning from, from the angle that I believe that every one of us in this place today, we have a desire that burns within our soul that I want to be a part of what God is doing. I'm just not here to get but I am here to be a part of. I, I want to be a part of the body of Christ. I, I want Him to flow through me as we preached Wednesday night. I want that which is in me to work outside of me. I want to be a part of the kingdom of God. I want to be successful in my walk with God. I want to be vibrant in my walk with God. I, I want to be solid in my walk with God. I want to be established in my walk with God. I want to be what He would have me to be, and I want to be a part of that. And we see that's how the early church was founded. That's how it was started. And we see that as time goes on, and they're really thriving, and they're doing good, and, and it got everybody all worked up. And those who didn't like the gospel, they didn't like Jesus, they didn't like the things that were going on, they got all up in the air, and it, got, it worked into such a frenzy that they literally began to kill people who would name the name of Jesus. People who would say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and I'm going to live for Him they said we're going to kill you and they begin to license some zealots and Apostle Paul who was at that, that time known as Saul who later changed his name to Paul he became a part of that mob Man, when you read the story of how the first martyr died, it says when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart and they gnashed on him with, 
with their teeth. I've had people get mad at me and not like what I preach, but I've never had anybody get so mad at me, they grab me and just start chewing on me. They may have flapped their jaws, but they never, <laughs> they never grabbed me and started chewing on me. They might have said some things. And, but he was full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And that made them mount more mad. And they, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young Young man's feet whose name was Saul who later became Apostle Paul and they stoned Stephen calling upon God saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice saying Lord lay not this sin to their charge and, and when he had said this he fell asleep in other words he died man what a background to start and Saul was consenting unto his death, and, and he said, that's the way we ought to do it. And so the authorities at me said, here's your papers, and they give him papers, warrants, I believe we would probably call them today. And he had, the, he had the ability to go to a house, kick the door, a no-knock warrant, and he could kick the door, and he could walk in, and he could say, Mom and Dad and children, you come with us. We're going to put you in jail. And they say, what have we done? And they said, you've been going to church, and you've been worshiping Jesus, and you've been trying to live for Him, and you've been declaring Him to be the one true king of kings and lord of lords and he had the ability to take them and you talk about starting a fire you talk about starting a fire a fire of persecution Stephen's death fueled the fire of opposition when they seen how they could stop it and they thought they could stop it and they, they so it antagonized them more and they got more excited but you see what they did not understand was that the, the Bible tells us that Jesus said in the book of Luke in chapter 12 and verse 49, we'll not put it up, but Jesus said, I am come to send fire on the earth. Jesus said, I didn't come to send warm and fuzzy. He said, I am come to send fire on the earth. And when they stoned Stephen, it kindled a fire of opposition. But what they thought to be a fire of opposition literally became a fire of revival that spread the gospel everywhere. There's no better way, I think, to spread a fire than to scatter a few hot coals. Amen. I've lived in the country long enough and I've burned enough fence rows out to know that you can start a fire at one end of the fence row, but, but you can wait all day for it to go a quarter of a mile. But you can start something on fire and walk about every 20 feet and stick it back down in there and then walk another 20 feet and stick it and down there. And before long, those fires will meet each other. Amen. There's no better way to spread a fire than to scatter the coals. And those who despised the church thought they could extinguish it by scattering it. But what happened was it only served to spread it farther. I don't have very, I'm not going to preach very long this morning, so stay with me. Let's, let's look at what the early church did when, when that type of persecution come. The Bible says in verse 4, could I have my picture up? In verse 4, verse 4, they went everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere they went, they went preaching the Word. They scattered the fire. It took off and it went. They went everywhere preaching the Word. They went to areas that previously had been forbidden because they were Jews and they went into Judea and they went into Samaria and they begin to scatter and there's something about people who get full of the Holy Ghost. We need to get something right here and settle it right now in our minds that it doesn't make any difference where we go. We don't leave the Holy Ghost at home. We don't leave it at church. We don't leave it anywhere. But wherever life takes us, we still have the Holy Ghost. And if the Holy Ghost is still the Holy Ghost and fire, it's still looking for some place to spread the fire of the Holy Ghost. And when they got news that they were coming with a no-knock warrant to come and serve at their house, and they were going to take everything they've got, and they were going to take them and put them in jail. When they were going to do that, you know what they did? They said, we got to get out of Dodge, folks. And they took off 
And when they went to where they were going, they did not go there to take their ease. Well, we're in Samaria now. We'll just, we'll just kind of blend in with the Samaritans. Not on your life. They were full of the Holy Ghost and fire to the point that the adversary said we want to get them and we take them and we'll kill them and we'll, we'll burn them at the stake. We'll feed them to lions. We'll stone them. We'll cut their heads off. We'll do every kind of torture we can thinking it's going to stop them. But all it did was when they went, they just began to do the work. They weren't there to take their ease, but they were there to do the work of the kingdom of God. You see, they went into Samaria and Judea, and if you look at the history of the church, they weren't strangers there, because if you look at the life of Jesus, and Brother Steve talked about how that the Gospels tells us about the life and the journey of Jesus Christ. He went into Samaria in one place. He said, I must needs go to Samaria. He went there and built a foundation. He went throughout Judea and built a foundation, and the adversary said, I'll put the church out, and he came and scattered the, the fire, and where did it go it went to Judea and Samaria where Jesus had laid a foundation and when they got there they began to tell people about Jesus and what it did was it started a revival fire and when they got scattered they were there and there was a foundation already there because of what Jesus had done now, we've always known we have always known that there is an adversary to your salvation you young folks that are just getting started in church, you need to understand something. Just because you give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ doesn't mean that the adversary left you and went looking for somebody else. He will try as long as you can inhale and exhale. He will try to discourage you. He'll try to destroy you. He'll try to deceive you. He'll try to tempt you. He'll try to get you to fall. He'll do everything you can. But when he wins a battle, remember that Jesus has already won the war. Oh, you've got to do is repent and get up and start over and keep trying to do good and keep going forth and keep going forth. But don't ever forget that you have an adversary who the Bible describes as a roaring lion who is on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. As of right now, we're privileged to live in a land with liberties. It gives us the ability to worship the Lord any way we want. I never, I never saw, you know, there, we'll see the police will go by, but they're not here to restrict us. It's like it says on their car, to protect. They, they'll protect us. If somebody came in and started to cause a ruckus and stop us, we could call 911 and they would come out and let, make them leave so we could have our freedoms to worship. We live in a land that as of right now, as of right now, we have the liberty to worship and praise God. If you don't want to clap your hands, you don't have to in America. If you want to clap your hands, you can. If you don't want to dance and shout before the Lord, you don't have to. But if you want to, you can. The government has no ability to restrict religion. And I'm thankful for that. But our adversary is not the government. Even though there's spiritual wickedness in high places, my adversary is not the government. My adversary is one that we call Lucifer, the Satan, the devil, anything we want to call him. He is my adversary and he is forever on the prowl. And if he can't get us today physically through persecution, he's still going to try to scatter us. Therefore they that were scattered abroad. Abroad means leaving your town, your area. They took off. They were scattered. And everywhere they went, they went preaching the word. Satan can't, has not yet. Let me, let me just clue you in on a little something. You can't run far enough to where Satan won't bother you. I'm going to Texas. I won't be bothered here. Satan knows how to get to Texas. I moved to Michigan. He knows where Michigan is. 
He'll move to California. He knows where California is. Man, you can pack everything you got up in a U-Haul truck and take off, and he'll ride right with you. And he'll start in on you before you get out of Greene County. He'll be waiting on you, and he'll start in on you. Let me put it in a little natural. If you can't cook here, you ain't going to move to California and know how to cook any better. Well, I'll go down to Mississippi. That's where all them good cooks are. But that won't make you one. <laughs> I'll move to Texas. That's where all the good old boys are. That won't make you a good old boy. If you're a jerk here, you'll be a jerk there. That jerk ain't got nothing to do with location. <laughs> ah, Hallelujah. Ain't got nothing to do with location. Amen. Well, come on. And if you think you're going to move or get out of this or go to there and that devil will leave you alone, you can't run fast enough or jump high enough or dig a hole deep enough that will get, get away from him because he is a relentless adversary and his job is to get you to where you don't want to live for God. And he can't today, say today, today we are not having bombs dropped on us and we are not having lockdown orders and we are not having any of those kind of things that, that would physically, what we could call physical persecution. I saw a picture this week of a man that was about 80 years old at a kitchen table and in the next chair was a little boy who was about three or four years old and they were both in a city of Ukraine and they were both on their knees in that kitchen table praying for their safety and their protection. We say, we talk about safety and protection, meaning we want to make it home from church without having an accident, or we, we, we don't want to fall when we're going through the yard. We, we talk about all kinds of stuff. We don't have bombs dropping on us, but our adversary still wants to scatter us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can't get us physically. He'll, he'll try to get us scattered in some other ways. To see the effects of life, life are not always his doing. Now, can I, can I clarify that real quick? Some people have it in their mind that everything that bad happens to them is the devil. You live to be a certain age and your hearing starts getting dull. That's not the devil. That's 80 years. That's 50 years for me. 60 years for me. Stuff just happens. You get 120,000 miles on a set of tires and they go bad on the way to church because you're running 75 with 100,000 miles on a set of 40,000 mile tires and your tire blows out. Don't get out and say, well, the devil caused me to have a blowout. No, the tires wore out. Oh, come on. We like to blame him for everything. We do. Limb falls off the house. Well, that's a devil. Cause that limb to fall off. He didn't cause the limb to fall off. It's a tree. And God made the trees. They're only resisting up to so many mile an hour wind. Well, I got a toothache. I guess the devil just give me a toothache. No, it's because you got a cavity that you didn't get fixed for four years. And it finally got abscess. That ain't the devil's fault. Now, oh, come on. How many times did this... Brother Steve had trouble getting you to raise your hands. How many times have we just used that as a quick throw off? Well, the devil, you know, bless God, the devil's in this and the devil did that and the devil did that. No, sometimes life... But here's what happens. Life happens. Life happens. Well, the devil shut the factory down. No, he didn't. The investors did. People get, oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just going to stop with it right there. Life happens. The devil doesn't cause everything to happen, happen. But what he does is he plays upon what happens. He knows how to manipulate you when life happens to you. Man, I had a toothache. I know because I just got a crown put on this week and I know how much they are. 
Well, I got a toothache. Every, I told my dentist, I said, every March for the last three years, I've had to get a root canal and a crown. I said, I'm going to try my best to go this March without having to get a root canal. The last one I had was hurting so bad when I, that doctor came in and said, I'm going to give you a shot. I said, hurry. <laughs> he said, well, it's not very often. He said, people say, hurry up and give me the shot. I said, it's hurting so bad. Well, I want the shot. Give me the shot. But then Satan comes along, and I'm just using that as a silly illustration because I don't want to get too heavy into personal things. But stuff happens to people because of life. And then Satan comes along, instead of being your comforter and saying, well, God understands, God will give you strength, and God will give you You know what he does? He comes along and he manipulates that problem by putting thoughts in your mind that, that you've messed up, somebody's messed up. It's because if you wasn't trying to live for God, if I wasn't trying to be a preacher, I wouldn't have had a toothache. That's not got anything to do with me being a preacher. If I wasn't trying to live for God, if I hadn't given to missions, then I wouldn't have this. If I did blah, 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 and on and on and on. He takes life's natural things and manipulates them. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? Amen. If you wasn't trying to live for God every time. Now, here's, here's one of his big manipulations. I thought when you became a Christian, you wouldn't have that because nobody else in the church is dealing with that. How do you know what they're dealing with? You don't have a clue. Well, they look like such a happy family. Yeah, but they might have slept in separate rooms for the last two years. Oh, my God, I shouldn't have said anything like that. Their kids look so happy, yeah, and they can't wait to get out of that house because it's such a hellhole when there ain't nobody. Else. You don't know what people are dealing with. Because we have been trained socially not to come to church and any place else and hang out our dirty laundry. We just come to church and live life. I've pastored for 40 years. I've seen people come to church and act every good way and, and every solid way. And you they'd find, some come find out, you find out some of the stuff they're having to deal with on the job, at home, and in their finances, and everything else. And we don't have a clue. But Satan comes and tells you, look at that family. I wish I could get an amen in here. I'm getting a few little nods, but we need to hit the bump in the road and get a good bobblehead nod. <laughs> it's a truth. Right. We look at people, we go, oh, they're so happy. They got everything. They got it made. Look at the vehicle they're driving. Yeah, they ain't made a payment on it six months, and tomorrow the repo person might come. <laughs> I hope that's not going to happen to anybody here. But You never know, Brother Steve, what people are going through. And you don't know what they lay awake at night and worry about. And you don't know the talks that a man and wife have trying to get through life. We don't know what people deal with with their kids and their finances and their health and all kinds of... We don't have a clue. But Satan comes along when you have a problem, then he manipulates you to think that your woe is you. You must have really messed it up. Because if you would have been everything you're supposed to be, you'd have been just like them. I, 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 this is uh, this, just one little personal thing that I'm going to move on. This was about six months after we lost Josh. I was working, and an old man came in there one time, and he sat down in the chair, and I was trying to act normal and be happy. And, and, and he said, uh, I said, how are you doing today? And he said, oh, it's been rough, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, okay. You know, I didn't need all of the details. Fine would have been, <laughs> just fine would have been. And, and he said, but you don't understand, because he said, you're not old enough to even know what a real problem is. I said, you're right. I didn't tell him. I wanted to say, you're right. I'm not old enough, but that age ain't got nothing to do with it. I mean, I, and, and, and so, but we don't have a clue by looking at people. One guy told me, he said, I've been praying for you. But he said, I see you're smiling and having a good time. He said, you don't need my prayers no more. I felt like saying, buddy, just because I'm smiling and laughing don't mean that I'm not hurting inside. Amen. And we don't know, but Satan comes along and he says, they're all happy. Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Why are you trying so hard? They don't even act like they even give a flip, and look how happy they are. Yeah. 
They don't give like you do. They don't try to worship like you do. They're not as faithful as you are. And look how they've got it all on. And you know what Satan does? Satan tries to manipulate the things of life to you to where he can do one thing. Get you scattered. The whole purpose is to just to get you scattered. His job is to get a reaction from us. And the reaction he wants is scattered. So according to the dictionary, and I like to look things up in the dictionary, scattered simply means two things, distracted or disorganized. So let's look at life from this angle. If he can get us scattered, which means distracted, a term we hear all the time now that we never used to hear is about distracted drivers. Used to, the big distraction was driving down the road and watching somebody shave. <laughs> have electric razor and as they're driving and they were shaving, you think, dear Lord. Or they'd have, <laughs> they'd have a big bag of fries. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd see them driving and looking for the ketchup and driving. <laughs> and I can remember, don't none of you young people ever try this? If my kids try this, I'll take their car. <laughs> It went from timeouts in the rooms, now it's take the car. <laughs> but how many remember back in the 60s and the 50s and the 60s, people had great big cars and people would brag about they could sit back in their cars and drive with their feet. Uh -huh. Distraction. <laughs> and then we got eight-track tapes. That was my biggest distraction, was an eight-track tape that wouldn't play and I was looking for a book. Some of you don't understand this. <laughs> All the gray hairs are going, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we're looking for a book of matches to put under the corner because it was double tracking. And it was, the young people are going, what? <laughs> Anybody remember? There was all because we couldn't find the book of matches. And we were sticking them under the corner trying to get that, to, that track to get back on track. And now it's cell phones and texting and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And distraction you know what and it's hard to focus it's amazing and I don't have the statistics with me and I wish I had them but you know what is amazing is how far you can go by the time you just reach down to grab your phone I followed a person home the other day from town out to my house is two miles and I followed him and it was eight o'clock in the morning and I thought if I was a cop I'd stop him because sure but surely they're not drunk this early but some of them are some of them got up and had their morning pint for breakfast or whatever but they was on this side of the road then they was almost in this ditch and, and, and I got up closer and I noticed what it was they was down like this 65 mile an hour don't ever do that you see it all the time and as you drive down the road you see it all the time please don't do that that's distraction and you know what Satan wants to do Satan wants to get you we started this message with how that our goal is to be successful and live for God and be a part of the kingdom of God and then he wants to take something that happens in life and get you distracted get you distracted Oh, yeah, you, you get all discouraged and you get all depressed because something happened and you get to where you can't stay focused. It makes to be distracted means it's hard to focus. And he makes it hard to focus on our mission because of the new focus, the problem that he has blown up in front of our face. Amen. And I'm hurrying the second thing it makes us do. It makes us to become disorganized. A person that's scattered, they can't find anything. That's not the word that I put. It's kind of like Brother Richard's one. I can't find my handkerchief, and I'm patting myself down. And I'm going, uh, uh. The other day I was sitting up here going, uh, uh. Brother Richard point said, it's over there. I went over there, and I grabbed it. You know, because I was disorganized, I should have had it, and we like to get everything in order. We get, we, we get everything held together, and we, we like to be disorganized. And, and, and to be successful in our walk with God, I believe we ought to have a little organization in our life. We ought to have some schedule. We ought to have some. And, and an organization is basically just disciplines. You men that have tools and, and you that are in law enforcement, and fire, you understand this. It's important that when you come back in from a fire run, you just don't leave everything where it is. Before you go in and eat dinner or do anything else, what do you do? You got to roll the hoses up. You got to get everything ready to go. Why? So that it's ready to go the next time. When you do a police report, you got to get things ready. It happens in everything we do. If it's on a farm, you got to make sure you shut the gate. You got you to make sure that the tractor has... 
everything you do, Brother White, you got to clean the dishes. You got to get it all ready to go. You got to make sure you've got clippers oil. You got to make sure there's nothing worse than being halfway through a job and realize that you were so disorganized that you didn't. In my home life, not my home life with my family, but in my outside activities, sometimes I'm not that organized. I'll lay something down and say, now, nah, I'll remember because this is right where I put it. Anybody ever do that? And then when you get ready to use it again, you think, now, where did I put it? And then I'll do the, the when I get it to where I can't find it, I do all I can do. Then I'll call my wife and say, come out here in the garage for a minute. And she'll come up here and say, what do you want? I say, I'm looking for a wrench that's about this long. And, <laughs> and she'll say, well, I don't know where it is. I said, I don't either. But I said, help me. <laughs> but if I'd have been organized, I'd have put it back. You see, and we, discipline is something we need in our walk with God. You, just, you don't just come to church haphazardly. You don't, you don't worship haphazardly. You don't live righteous haphazardly. You don't pray haphazardly. But we do those things and because they help us stay on track. And they help us to be what we're supposed to be. But if He can get me scattered. Never seem to get it done. We must realize that God wants us to further His kingdom. We should realize that God allows us sometimes to get scattered. He allows us to get scattered so that we can have a fresh opportunity. We should look for an opportunity to share the Word of the Lord. In John chapter 1, Brother Steve talked about it in his Sunday school lesson this morning. Jesus was God made flesh. And so when we preach the Word, what should we be telling people? What should we be looking for an opportunity to do? Share Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. You want to know what the Lord has done for me? Well, you look like everything is going wrong. This is my opportunity to take the fire off of the altar and take it down the fence row and put it in and see it go a little farther. What do we do when we get scattered? I quit. That's what I do. I just pout. I get discouraged. I get depressed. I don't say nothing to nobody. No, when they got scattered, they preached Jesus. The early church must have felt the stress of the scattering. Much like the church in Ukraine is today. I read a deal from the missionary that we highlighted the other day last Sunday. He said, I had just published a book. And we were setting up to evangelize and to reach five areas of the nation of Ukraine. It was a book on salvation. And they were going to do a mass production and a mass distribution about the Acts 238 message. And he said, and we felt so fired up like God was going to do something. And he said, now, now, he said, the war came. And he said, we have been scattered. And he said, but we're not going to quit. He said, we're going to use this opportunity to wherever God sends us. Wherever God sends us. Wherever God sends us to tell about the mighty God in Jesus and the name of Jesus. He said, it's not going to be like we planned, but we're still going to do everything we can. What we need to do today is we need to allow God's Spirit to calm our scattering. We need to let God calm our scattering. Brother McKinney's here baptized in Jesus' name. Last week, a couple years or so ago, he was living in Paradise, California, and a fire came through and swept down through there where he lived and burned everything they had up. Scattered him. But he came here from the scattering of what they called the paradise fires. And he could have said, I've had enough of God if that's what God does. But he didn't do that. You know what he did? He used it as an opportunity. And you know what he did last week? He was baptized in the name of Jesus. Because a church, 
a church full of people who understand scattering. Refuse to stay scattered and quit. But we've allowed the fire that burns within us to take a hold and we're going to see God do some great things. If you look at that scripture, I won't have to put it up. But in chapter 8 where we took our text, in verse 1, it says, And at that time there was a great persecution. But it only takes verse 8, and it says, And there was great joy in that city. If we can harness our scattering and not let when life scatters us cause us to be defeated, but if we can take it and channel it and use it for the glory of God, we can go from great trouble to great joy. Notice here what Paul said, who was the main player. Nick, give me Philippians 1 and 12. What he said about what happened in his life after he got all through with it. He said, and I would... Ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He said, I want you to understand one thing. He said, everything that's happened to me, he said, I've used it to the furtherance of the gospel. Brother David Bernard, the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church, made this quote, and I'm going to change one word in there. He said, what should the church do in the time of crisis? And I'm going to change the word church there and leave that blank and let you put your name in there. What should Mark Morris do in the time of crisis? This is what he said. We've got to trust God and pray. We move from fear to faith. We move from panic to peace and we replace worry with prayer. You can get mad and blame God all you want to about your scattering and He's not going to give in to you and He's not going to fix it. But it's when you trust Him and pray and move from fear to faith and move from panic to peace and replace our worry with prayer that we'll survive the scattering. Would you stand with me this morning? Without music today...